So uh, we're going to start with that here. So if you want to go to Ephesians chapter number 4, go to Ephesians chapter number 4. And we're going to be looking at verse number 17. And we're going to look about four or five verses here this morning. And uh, there is a clock on the pulpit that's good. Uh, I was preaching last week, and honestly, I couldn't find the clock anywhere. I have my cell phone, but I've got to tap it twice to get the, which is kind of hard when you're preaching, tap your cell phone to get the time. And, and at that place, they had a big space in front of the pulpit last week, and I was pacing back and forth in front of the pulpit. And I didn't know, I didn't, my cell phone's back here. I, I'm, I, I preached way too long. About the end of the week, I looked up and saw a digital clock way up in the balcony, and I told the people, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. I honestly didn't see it, but you don't have to worry from now on. I'll be on time from now on. So you got a clock here, so we should be okay. And uh, independent Baptists won't tell you this, but I, I'm a preacher's kid, so I know this. Right there, there's a secret trap door, and if I go too long, the pastor will hit the button. Okay, so don't have to worry about that. Uh, we'll get you home for your roast and all that fun stuff, but, um, uh, but we are uh, looking forward to this ministry this week. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to look at verse number 17. Read three verses of Scripture, and I want you to see something here. It says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. Of course, he says, therefore, he's been talking about particularly the local church and the importance of being involved and being a part of the local church. He says, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. And here's the key phrase, in the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding, okay, now we've got the mind again, the understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus. Several years ago, somebody was just talking with me, and they said, you know, you ought to watch this little video about Tom Brady and an interview he had several years ago. I think at the time, Tom Brady had won three Super Bowls, which is, of course, remarkable in and of itself, but that was about halfway through. And uh, he was on the top of the world, of course, signed big contract, had the money, had the fame, and three Super Bowls, and he was still young. And I guess he's still young. But anyway, and uh, I uh, remember watching the video, and it was a sportscaster who was asking him questions after the Super Bowl. And he said something like this. He said, Tom, how does it feel? I mean, here you are, three Super Bowls. And... And I'll never forget Tom Brady's answer. He looked at him with consternation. I think he even looked down. He said, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something more. And the sportscaster just kind of rolled with it and said, well, Tom, what do you think it is? He looks back at him with just consternation written on his face. He said, I wish I knew. Now I want to ask you something, friends. If you had three Super Bowl rings and money like you'll never know what to do with, and you have not fulfillment in life, something's wrong. And I want to tell you something, friends. As I'm looking on this audience, I'm not trying to be unkind. I don't see any future NFL quarterbacks out here. And probably if we composite the money in this room, it wouldn't even come close to what Tom Brady gets in one football game. So what hope do we have? Well, the problem, friends, is simply this. Tom Brady was looking in the wrong place. He bought into the wrong philosophy of life. And as a result, all the accomplishments he has are not bringing him fulfillment. That word vanity here is really talking about someone who's empty. They're unfulfilled. Life is not giving them what they thought life was going to give them. It's like this, friends, that I, when I was in high school, I had to make a decision. And every one of you young people, young adults and teenagers, are making or have made this decision. The decision was this. Am I going to live for that which I can see? Or am I going to live for that which I can't see? The things which you see are temporal. Have you ever noticed that there's no U-Hauls behind hearses? Have you ever noticed that? See, why? Because if you live for the temporal, guess what? When you die, you leave it all. When you live for the eternal, you're living for that which you cannot see. The Bible says the things which you cannot see are eternal. Things which you can see are temporal. Everything you can look at, I'm sorry, if you just bought a new car, I hate to tell you this, everything you can look at is temporary. And if you live my length of time, that new car 20 years later is not as nice as it once was. See, all of us understand that the temporal is that which will not last. And the truth is, you are a teenager, every one of you makes the decision, I'm going to live for that which I cannot see, or I will live for that which I can see. And I will promise you, if you live for that which you, cannot see, which you can see, you're not bringing any of it with you. Someone asked someone who would know when John D. Rockefeller died, 
who if you adjust wealth, was the richest man in modern history. In recorded history, he's the richest man. When John D. Rockefeller died, somebody asked one of his accountants or somebody, hey, how much did he leave? And the answer was, he left it all. He left it all. When I was a teenager, I made a decision. I'm not living for that which I can see. I'm not dumb. I like good investments. So I'm going to live for that which you can't see because you get to bring it with you. It'll still be around a million years from now. So when the Bible says here it's challenging us to not walk in the mindset, really talking about the mentality, the mindset of people who are lost. Of course, these were Gentiles, and of course the city of Ephesus was a very interesting city. If you know much about it, uh, they worshipped the goddess Diana. you find that in the book of Acts. But uh, that Diana worship, I won't even go into it because it's so profligate, so wicked, so lascivious, it just would not even be appropriate to even begin to describe how wicked it was. And the great temple was right there in the city. And, of course, these Gentiles, you know, if you think the United States of America was wicked, and it is, probably Ephesus would beat us. So this was a very wicked culture, and uh, it was, in, of course, it was uh, these new converts had come out of this culture, and the Apostle Paul, writing here, basically is urging them, don't walk like other Gentiles. In other words, like your other people around you. Don't walk like they walk, and here's how they walk, in the vanity of their minds. Now, everybody in this room is either living for the eternal or you're living for the here and now. Now, this passage of Scripture is going to tell us what it looks like when we live in the emptiness of our mind. Now, you're going to see three descriptions here. And I believe in a certain sense, they're kind of, uh, they build on each one another. This one happens, then this one happens, and then this one happens. And when you get to the final step, it's pretty bad. And honestly, you almost feel like you're describing modern culture. It's really what you, and, but yet, you know what I found in working with teenagers from Christian homes, a lot of them are deeply imbibing in and deeply influenced by pop culture. And as a result, they're not thinking biblically. They're not thinking right, which means they're walking in the emptiness of their mind. It's not going to last. I, I don't, I'm trying to be unkind, but Bill Gates walks in emptiness. Because when Bill Gates dies, I'm going to tell you something, he's going to be a spiritual pauper if he doesn't come to Jesus Christ before he dies. See? So understanding all of that, it's important for us to see we live in a world that values the wrong things. <laughs> so let's just look at the passage of Scripture, walk through it, and I'm going to give you a few diagnostics that over the years I have seen that will be applications from the verse of Scripture. So let's go uh, right there to the next verse, verse number uh, 18. It says, uh, uh, of course, walk not, and here's the participle. There's two participles in this, verse 18, and by the way, let me just say this. I tell this to teenagers all the way. If you're going to get ready for college, I was saying this to pastor last night, then you need to know there's three things, English grammar, composition, and critical thinking. Got that, teenagers? Aren't you excited? Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? Those are the three things you need if you're going to go to college. Okay, but anyway, it helps you in studying the Bible, by the way. So there's two participle phrases here, and notice what they says here in verse, said in verse number 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now here's what you got, basically if you diagram it out. You have two participle uh, phrases here, and uh, there's inter- ways to interpret this. Now you have to understand interpretation is different than language, okay? In other words, sometimes if the language says something, there's no other way to interpret that does what it means. But sometimes there's interpretation. And when it comes to uh, participle phrases and their usages, there are interpretations. So I'm going to give you my interpretation. It seems to me that the second one is causal. So what he's saying is having the understanding darkened. Why? Because they're alienated from the life of God. So I see being alienated from the life of God as the first step down. Then your understanding becomes darkened. Then you get into verse number 19, which is the profligate living. So I want to get too technical, so let's talk about that. It says being alienated from the life of God. Now I want you to understand, friends, everybody in this room this morning uh, is either alienated from the life of God or you're connected to it. I'm talking about salvation. Now there's two reasons people are going to hell. Can I tell you that? There's two reasons. Here the Bible tells us. Number one, because of the ignorance that is in them. If you're in this room lost and going to hell, let me tell you that one of the reasons you may be lost is this. You never heard how to be saved. (laughs) And if you've never heard how to be saved, the reason you're not connected with Jesus, who is the life, is simply because 
You don't know how. You don't know how to get saved. You're ignorant of it. About four weeks ago, my wife and I had the wonderful privilege of doing a follow-up visit. Uh, at the uh, college there, they do uh, at this church, they do a Christmas program, and uh, we had several of people come, and we had a multitude of visits, that follow-up visits that needed to be made. And this year, the church leadership said, let's, let's do something in our follow-up we've never done before. Let's challenge people to take the Gospel of John challenge, and let's uh, ask them, would you be willing to read the Gospel of John in the next two months? And we'll come back halfway, and we'll come back at the end and answer your questions and help you understand the book. It's kind of a gospel opportunity. So um, my daughter, uh, Jana, some of you know Jana. She was here, I think, on the ensemble. Uh, she works at a, a nearby music school, and, and uh, she had uh, this uh, dear couple, had an autistic son, and he's, he's mildly autistic. He functions fairly well. He's still got some issues, but uh, she teaches him piano. And uh, she was um, working with them, and and invited them to come to the program. Long story, they came to the program, and uh, we were doing the follow-up visit, my wife and I. So we sat down with them, and my wife gave them, uh, gave, uh, actually the husband wasn't there, so it was just the, the, the mother and the boy, and my wife was going through the gospel, particularly with the boy, but in her mind she also had the mother in view, and given the gospel there, and I remember when she finished, I, I looked at her, I said, have you ever heard that before? And here's what, she's been in church, she goes to church every Sunday. I said, have you ever heard that before? Here's her answer. No, I've never heard that before. But that's so simple. Now, thank the Lord. She, she, did, she didn't get saved on that visit, but thank the Lord. My wife and I had the privilege of do, coming back about three or four weeks later, and she's wonderfully born again. And it was a wonderful, her and her husband both got saved. It was a great story. I don't have time to go into that right now. But here's my point. You know why she was lost? I'll tell you why she was lost. Because she didn't know. She didn't know. Someone in this room may be in your sins, lost and going to hell. And the only reason you're lost and going to hell, you don't know. Well, I got good news for you. Let me just give it to you real quickly. Jesus came down, died on a cross, shed his blood. When he died, every one of your sins was laid on him. He suffered for your sin. He was buried. He conquered sin, death, and hell, rose from the grave the third day. And if you'll trust him this morning, he'll wash your sins away and keep you out of hell. Trust him to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Now, I know that was quick, but now you're not ignorant. Jesus is the way to heaven. He said, I am the way, no man gets the Father but by me. And the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ, who is the life. Okay, so some people uh, are alienated from the life of God because they don't know. Now, the Bible says, next of all, no, because of the blindness, see it there, because of the blindness of their heart. Now, the word blindness there is one of those words that has a nuance of meaning, not only the idea of blindness, but the idea of hardness. If I could put it be like this, he'd be like somebody who had hardening of the arteries, and as a result, they lost their eyesight. So that's the idea here. So it has the idea of hardness, which means the second reason people uh, are not connected to the life is because they've heard it and rejected it. See, that dear lady, that day we presented the gospel to her, my wife started to press toward a decision, and she resisted it. So for the next three weeks, she was alienated from the life of God no longer because of ignorance. She was alienated from the life of God because she hardened her heart. But then three or four weeks later when we went back, God had prepared her heart and been preparing heart, and she was wide open. Actually, her husband got saved, and while he was getting saved, she got saved. We just didn't know it. And my wife said, did you pray with your husband while we were doing it? She said, yes, I did. Uh, she was so excited she had gotten saved. It was amazing. Okay, but here's my point. Those are the only two reasons you're lost this morning. If you're in this room and do not know Jesus, you either don't know the gospel or you know it and you've hardened your heart. Now, here's the thing I want you to see. This is not addressed, this passage of Scripture here is not addressed to lost people. It's addressed to saved people. So what's he saying? He's saying this. The first thing that gets you in trouble in your Christian life, where you begin to walk like lost people and begin to have emptiness or futility of life, the thing that gets you in trouble on that is you're alienated from the life of God. Now, don't get me wrong. You can be in union with Jesus as far as salvation is concerned, but in your Christian life, you are not connected up with the life. That's why you need revival. <laughs> You can be alienated from the life of God. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about the Christian life. Because somebody that is living in the reality of the, uh, living in the uh, energized, enabled by that life, there's a connection there, a spiritual vitality, a spiritual reality in their life. Now, why would a Christian 
live needing revival. Live grieving the life. Why would a Christian do that? Well, two reasons. Number one, they might be ignorant. You know, some Christians might say, well, I'm trying hard. I'm doing the best I can. I'm working at this Christian life stuff. It's just not working for me. Okay, some Christians can do that. They're ignorant. They don't, listen, we have kids come to Bible college. They're raised in good homes. But it's like the lights come on. Oh, the Christian life's not by trying hard. The Christian life's by trusting Jesus to enable you to do it. See, why do they live lives defeated, discouraged, uh, you know, with not a lot of reality in their life? Why? Because they were ignorant. They didn't realize the way you connect with Jesus is not by trying. The, you, you connect with Jesus by trusting. It's not just salvation. It's the Christian life. And when they had that almost illumination for some of them was like getting saved all over again. Trusting, wow, sanctification is by faith. I remember when the lights came on for me. Oh, sanctification's by faith. I was a preacher's kid. I was working hard. It wasn't working. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I can't do this Christian life stuff. And I will tell you, friends, when the lights came on, I realized, oh, it's not me. It's trusting Jesus to enable me. Wow. See, so some of you are perhaps in this room are alienated from the life of God. Your Christian life's not going very, you're not seeing a lot of miracles, not a lot of answers to prayer. It's not going real, uh, not, not moving forward uh, in a dynamic way is because you're ignorant. Now, maybe somebody like that. And there's a second reason. And that is you're alienated from the life of God, not because you're ignorant. You've heard preaching. You know that it's not you, it's Jesus. You know all that. What your problem is, you hardened your heart. See, the way you enter into union with Jesus, I'm talking now in the sanctification sense, is you've got to deal with your sin, and some people aren't willing to do that. Dealing with your sin means you're going to get, you've got to get right with God, and you've got to do it the Bible way. And you've got to means you're going to have to get some things right, maybe, and get right with some people, and maybe get accountable to somebody, or whatever it might be. I work with teenagers all the time. I've seen personal revival almost every week of my life. I'm working with teenagers. You know why? Because when they come and say, Mom and Dad, I've been sneaking garbage behind your back. I've been looking at stuff on the Internet. I did this. I've been cheating on this test. They go to a teacher. I've been cheating on this test. I did this. Okay, you know what happens? God marches into their life. If you cover your sin, you won't prosper. If you confess and forsake, you'll have mercy. And I'm simply saying when people start doing it the Bible way, they start getting connected back to the life See, so you have to understand the life, as I mentioned in Sunday school, is not an it. It's a he. <laughs> you know what 1 John says, talking about, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and seen it and declare unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. So I want to ask you, what being was with the Father and manifested unto us? And the answer is Jesus Christ. He is that eternal life. And when you got saved, eternal life moved in. But I'm telling you, friend, you can become alienated from eternal life. You know why? Because he's a person. You can grieve a person. You can be alienated from a person. And the very first step downward in your Christian life, so you live in the emptiness and vanity of your mind, is you live and disconnect with the life. There's something between you and Jesus. You're not connected up to the life. You've grieved the life. You've quenched the life. Okay, so I want to give you some diagnostic questions because these would indicate you're not connected to the life. And I've certainly seen this a few years ago, uh, yeah, about a year ago, I was counseling a young man in our college and he was struggling in a relationship with his father and really struggling with bitterness toward his dad. And I remember as I was talking to him, uh, I, I asked him this question. I said, have you ever in your Christian life really met with Jesus and known the reality of God in your life? He smiled real big. I knew he had. That's why I asked him. Then I asked him this question. When you are living in the reality of who Jesus is and you're, you're living in that spiritual reality, I've got a question for you. What we're talking about, is it any big deal? And he smiled at me and said, no, it's not. See, when you're disconnected from Jesus, there are problems that will come into your life that will be solved if you connect with Jesus. So let me give you diagnostic. Number one, worthlessness. Do you feel worthless? Did you know that worthlessness is not the way God views you? <laughs> do you know if you're saved and on your way to heaven, God has made you to do something? I tell teenagers every, all, the, all across the world, uh, the, the countries I, I travel this. God has uniquely made you to do something only you can do like God made you to do it. And if you don't do it, it's not getting done. 
See, the point is, every single one of us in this room, when God looks at us, we were evidently, he looked at us, he died for us, and is very dying for us, and then he gave us a purpose for life. See, somebody who senses worthlessness in their life is not connected with Jesus. Because if you're walking with Jesus, you will not feel worthless. You know what you, instead you will feel? Destiny. I was talking with a young man. I won't go into all my connection with him, but clearly God's hand is on his life. And I talked about it's so important to spend time with God every day because I said when you spend time with God, you have a sense of destiny. I remember as a young man, and, and I didn't do it perfectly, but as I began to seek after God and God began to make himself real to me, in those moments where I sensed the manifest presence of God, there was such an overwhelming sense of destiny I could not get away from it. I knew God had a plan for my life, and I knew it was bigger than I could imagine. I want to tell you something, friends, if you don't feel that in your life, young person, you are alienated from the life of God. Because if you're meeting with Jesus every day, you can't feel worthless. Because he's gotten something big for you to do. Generally, people feel worthless because they're not dealing with their sin. As a result, you know what happens if you don't deal with your sin? Satan will come in there uh, and he will, he'll start tearing you up, making you feel like you're worthless. And then you know what happens? You start being secret. You start going to secrecy and you, you spin the walls around you and uh, trying to keep it all secret. That's exactly what the devil wants. But you know what happens if you come and confess it and get it right with God? You'll get free and Jesus will move into your life and you won't sense that anymore, uh, that worthlessness. So uh, that's, that's the first. Uh, uh, how about this one? Number two, insecurity. It kind of goes along with it. Self-doubt. This is the person who, uh, the, one of the issues is, in, is uh, insecurity, I put it this way. It's a person who lives in fear. <laughs> you fear what people really think about you? Do you fear about what people think, you know, are you fear about, okay, I wonder what that person really thinks about me, or et cetera, you, and those kind of things. You know, it, it's interesting when I was reading some, I can't remember who I was reading, but they made a point I never thought of before. Jesus had one command, a negative command he used over and over again. In fact, it's the number one negative command that Jesus gave in his ministry, the number one. And you know what it is? Fear not. If that's the number one command, it must be he kind of knew that we human beings were going to have a propensity to fear. What do you think? We fear what people think. We fear if we're going to succeed. We fear if we're going to make it. We fear what other people think about us. We fear, if we, we fear are we not valuable. We wonder if we'll, if we'll ever be loved. We have fear. Now, I will tell you this. When you have fear like that, it means at that moment you're not connected up to Jesus because when you get that wall down and you're no longer grieving the Holy Spirit and you have that vibrant relationship, it's hard to fear when you know he's there. So... That's another symptom that we're not, we're thinking unbiblically. We're not thinking according to uh, Bible thinking. How about this one? Do you struggle with trusting? Struggle with trusting. Have a young man, uh, oh, he's not young anymore, but um, he tells the story this way. When he was five years old, his dad walked out of his life. He said, every time my dad would come back, he said the pain was unbelievable. Because my dad would just reinforce the rejection. He, I'd, you know, I'd go grab his leg, he'd push me away. He said, every thought of my dad since he left was painful. He said, I cried myself to sleep multiple times at, as a little boy hoping my dad would come home. This was not a Christian home. He said, when he was 12 years old, the pain was so great. He said, man, I turned to drugs, alcohol, just trying to make sense out of it. I'm just trying to numb the pain. He said, I gave 10 years of my life to crystal meth. He said, at 28 years old, he said, I was in the shower. He said, I was on six Oxycontins a day, which is, of course, the opioid issue. And he said, I'd take multiple showers a day because it would make my skin crawl. He said, um, I was in that shower, and I wrote on the steamed glass, somebody please help. Well, I got out of the shower. The phone was ringing. He picked it up. It was his sister, who's a believer, and said, Matthew, I don't know what's wrong, but something's wrong. She had no idea about his addictions. He was what we call a functioning addict. Some of you are familiar with that terminology. And uh, she says, Matthew, I don't know what's wrong, but something's wrong. And he said, nothing's wrong. He said, Matthew, you need Jesus. He'd heard the gospel. For you need Jesus. Wash your sins away and save you. And, of course, uh, he just got angry and put the phone down. And then, amazingly, he got on his knees and trusted Jesus Christ to wash his sins away and save him. 
So some phone calls may not go out well, but you don't know what happens the seconds afterwards. He got saved. Yeah, when he got saved, he started growing the Lord. He made it. In fact, his second prayer after salvation prayer was an unusual prayer. He said, God, if you take away my addictions, I will give you my life. He said, at that moment, I was delivered. No cold turkey, no withdrawal. And he immediately made good, and he enrolled a Baptist college ministry. That's why I know the story. Went there four years, graduated. He's now a church planner in northern Wisconsin. But I've talked to him a lot about some of these issues that, you know, young people face today, these dysfunctional home issues. And when I was talking to him, here's what he said to me. In fact, I heard him preach this as well. He said, I struggle. He said, I'll be honest with you, my greatest struggle in my Christian life is trust. He said, when I was growing up, I could not trust my mother. I couldn't trust my father. I couldn't trust my siblings. I couldn't trust anybody. He said, my greatest struggle in my Christian life is trust. Now, you tell me, when he is walking with Jesus in the reality, the spiritual reality of Jesus Christ's presence, I guarantee you, he does not struggle with trust. So when we're struggling with trusting, that's another indication that we're not linked up with the life. There's something grieving the life. How about this one? Addictive video game. I meet teenagers all the time, I hope there's none in this room, who at 2 a.m. were up doing video games. Now, I'm going to say to any teenager in this room, if you're doing video games when you should be doing something else, you're addicted. And at 2 a.m., I'm going to tell every teenager in this room something. You shouldn't be doing video games. This may shock you. You should be sleeping, particularly if you're in school. So when a kid's up at 2 a.m. doing video games, and mom and dad, I'm just telling you right now, you say, well, my kid's not doing that. Well, I hope not, but I was in one church, and... The preacher's kid was falling asleep every service, and so one of my team members that happened to be with me tapped him and said, up at 2 a.m. doing video games, eh? <laughs> kid looked at him like, how did you know? Well, he knew because he did it. When he was a preacher's kid, and he did it when he was a kid. Listen, I'm just telling you right now, teenagers, if you don't do your homework, but you do video games, you're addicted, and you are not, you are not linked up with Jesus. Because when you're linked up with Jesus, you do your first responsibilities first. <laughs> and you don't get addicted to something. You're not looking to video games to give you dopamine. You look to Jesus to meet your needs, see? And kids are daily hooked on video games, just hooked on them. If I walk into an average Christian school, all i got to do is mention the name Fortnite, and you can just say a ripple uh, through all the junior high kids. I mean, the senior high kids have moved on. I mean, Fortnite's kids play, but they've moved on. But they all react. You know why? I'm telling you why, because most of them are addicted. You ask them the last time they met with Jesus, they can't even tell you what that's like. They don't meet with Jesus. And I'm just telling you, friends, this is, they didn't get that from the Bible. They got that from culture. They're walking in the vanity of their mind. I don't care who you are, but if you're looking to video, find video games to find some kind of fulfillment or satisfaction in life, you will be sorely disappointed. Many people flee to video games because they're trying to find reality in a virtual world. They may call it virtual reality, but I'm telling you right now, it's not real. And it's a whole lot better to walk with Jesus and find fulfillment in real reality, real-time stuff. Listen, when you get in the will of God and you start seeing people get saved and lives getting changed, I'm telling you, the world has nothing on that. It has nothing on spending time with Jesus and meeting with God and knowing the reality of his presence and knowing the fact he's leading me, he's guiding you, a sense of destiny in your life because you know God's hand is nothing like that. Video games will dull that if you're not careful. I'm not saying it's all wrong, but I don't know that I've ever seen it done right. The point I'm making, friends, is you've got to wake up, smell the coffee. You're already on the first thing down. You are not walking with Jesus, and it's either because you're ignorant or because it's hard, you've hardened your heart. If you're sitting out right now resisting, you can do that, but you're clearly proving the Bible. The reason you're not connected up with walking with Jesus is because you hear the truth, but you're resisting it. See, Not just video games. How about social media? Now, I'm not saying all social media is wrong. I realize people use it right. But I'm telling you, friends, if that becomes excessive in your life and you become addicted to that social media, you've got a problem. And I guarantee you, you're not walking with Jesus. Some people live on that stuff. There's live on it. In fact, i got a video clip. I'm not going to show it. Uh, but um, it's about a six-minute video clip of a guy who's lost as can be. Clearly, you'd figure that out pretty fast. And because uh, he talks about alcohol and, and et cetera. And he talks about the fact that this generation's in trouble. He said, they know now that when people use social media, it triggers dopamine responses. 
And he said, the problem is this. He said, when a teenager experiences experiments with drugs or alcohol before his brain is f uh, fully formed, he has far more likely to be addicted to drugs and alcohol than if he started back in his late 20s. Once that brain is formed, it's harder to get addicted than it would be when you're younger. And that, and that many uh, alcoholics and drug abusers started in their teens. Well, we know that. He said, here's the problem. He said, social media does the same thing. And he said, he was very basically concerned that this generation is going to be addicted. That when they come to troubles in life, like the older generation fleas went to the bottle, this generation is going to go to social media. It was like the other day I was at a restaurant. Uh, we walked out. Of course, we had, I can't even remember who I was with. We had a good conversation. And I remember walking by the window, and there was a family sitting there, and everybody's on their device. I'm thinking, put the stupid device over and talk to each other. <laughs> I'm not saying technology is wrong. I'm just simply saying Satan can use it. If that's what you're looking to for fulfillment and satisfaction in life, then you need to understand something. You're on step number one. I'm telling you, I'm not looking to technology to bring meaning out of life. I've got to look to Jesus to bring meaning out of life. i got to meet with Jesus. And when you've got to meet with Jesus every day, you know you need God. That's what you look to to bring meaning, satisfaction, and fulfillment out of life. And those of you that have an extended time with God, and God is a very important part of your life, you know what I'm talking about. But I'm telling you, excessive social media, how about this, excessive media use. A few months ago, I had a kid stop me. Probably 16, 17 years old. I preach, I don't know why I'm telling you this. But Monday night, he said, I, I spent Monday night. Every, I didn't sleep at all. He said, I spent the entire night on YouTube, watching YouTube videos. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now. I can guarantee you that kid's not walking with Jesus. And I can guarantee you he's addicted. He's got a problem. You know why? Because he should have been sleeping. Because the next day he went to work, and I guarantee you he cheated his employer. He did not give him what he should have given him. My point is, what's he trying to do? Well, I know he comes from a, a difficult situation. He's trying to find meaning and satisfaction and fulfillment in the wrong place. I hate to tell you this, friend. You are not going to find fulfillment in Hollywood. Hollywood still hadn't figured out what life's all about. <laughs> but the Holy Word has. See. So being alienated from the life of God, I'm just simply saying... Everybody in this room that's saved, every one of you is either connected right now with Jesus, walking in the reality of God, man, meeting with Jesus on a regular basis, and man, you, or you're not. And if you're not, you will always have to try to find reality, fulfillment, and satisfaction somewhere. But if you're looking for it in any place other than Jesus, you're going to be in danger of getting hooked on something. Uh, what the Bible calls it a besetting sin. Something that will not fulfill you. And young people are particularly have a propensity to do that. I'm not trying to be unkind to you, young people. I don't know you. Your pastor hadn't said a word. If you're out here thinking, man, the preacher dumped and told me all the junk I was doing. No, the truth is that's not true. He didn't tell me you're using video games. He didn't tell me social media. He didn't tell me any of that stuff. I'm just preaching. It's like the old radio preacher Oliver B. Green used to say. Uh, he said, I'm just preaching. He said, uh, I, I, I'm dialing the number or you answer the phone. Okay, so if the phone's ringing, answer it. That's how he put it. Okay, so if your phone ain't ringing, don't worry about it. Okay, so that brings us to the next thing. Okay, of course, I uh, could be a couple other things here. Um, obviously, inappropriate media. That would be the, the dirty stuff we talked about in Sunday school. Overeating. This is people that turn to food to find fulfillment and satisfaction. This is just what it is. In fact, just a few weeks ago, there was a young man by the name of Sean Milliken who died at 29 years old. Sean Milliken died at 900 pounds. 900 pounds. He had a father that was very angry, put him in the corner and scream at him, and the way he coped with it, his food. And as a result of that, he literally ate himself into an early grave. It's sad. I mean, I, I say it as compassionately as I know how. But see, when people turn to anything other than Jesus to meet their needs, you're going to the wrong place. Um... Just one other one I think we can throw out here just to kind of help us understand this, this is issue. Of course, drug and alcohol addictions, we've referred it, but that's the opioid crisis would not be a crisis if our country walked with Jesus. You don't need Jesus. You don't need drugs if you got Jesus. <laughs> See. Now that brings us to our next point. Okay, alienated from the life of God. And we're going to have to move quickly. Well, I didn't this, uh, who knows, might have to do plan B on this one. Back when I was a kid, sometimes I do, you know, stay tuned type deal. But anyway... Look what it says in verse 18. Having the understanding darkened. 
Now, I, I again believe because of the participle phrases, having the understanding darkened because you've been alienated from the life of God. That's the way I take it as causal. So you, they kind of flip in order. Because first of all, you get alienated from the life of God, and the second thing that happens is this. Your understanding gets darkened. Now, the word understanding is an interesting word. It's the word mind, and it's the preposition on the front side, through. So the idea is you're thinking through. In other words, it's your ability to reason. So it's like this. When you get disconnected from Jesus, I am telling you, friend, you're not going to think right. Your whole reasoning process will be messed up. Have you ever wondered, ever listened to some of these people out here today and thinking, how could you think that? Because they're not connected to Jesus and their whole thinking through process gets darkened. Now, you have to understand about dark, darkness. See, the darkness is different than light. Light is offensive. Darkness is not. In other words, have you ever, you've heard of a flashlight? Have you ever heard of a flash dark? You turn it on and there's a beam of darkness. No, see, darkness is not offensive. Dar darkness is simply the absence of light. Now, light's offensive. I mean, you, you turn on the light, whew, it, 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 darkness can't play our offense. All darkness does is, is retreat when there's light. It's different. So how does your understanding get darkened? And the answer is because you took a step away from light. Now don't miss this. If you step a step away from, if you take a step away from life, who is Jesus, you are also taking a step away from light. Now when I think of life, I think of Jesus. When I think of light, I think of the Word of God. And there's a mystical union between the incarnate word Jesus and the inscribed word the Bible. So a step away from one is a step away from the other. And so it's just, it's going to happen. If you're not walking with Jesus this morning, I am telling you, you don't think right. I'm not trying to be unkind, you just don't think right. And that thinking through process becomes darkened. That's why teenagers sometimes will leave a great Christian home and walk out into the world. Why? Because somewhere along the line, they, took, they hardened their heart to life, and in doing so, they didn't realize they were hardening their heart to light. And I will tell you, get rid of light, and you have darkness. Now, my greatest illustration of this is, is a cave. Anybody been into, like, a, a cave? I'm talking not one with lights in it, you know, not a one you pay to get in, just a cave that is a real cave. <laughs> okay, anybody ever been in one of those? <laughs> okay, those are kind of weird because you, you're, 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 you're just, you know, this, you're just, okay, so here's what happened. I, I met a youth pastor years ago in downstate Indiana, and he said to me, oh, yeah, I, I go in this cave all the time. And I said, like, I mean, a real cave? Yeah, I said, there's no fluorescent lights? No, it's just a cave. I said, do you think I could bring my youth group down from Chicago? And these kids would love to go into a cave, especially one that was like a real cave. <laughs> And so he said, sure, I can be your guide. I've been there, you know, many times. I can take you. Well, I was a youth pastor for a short amount of time. I think I mentioned this in Sunday school. And I fell into a terrible trap. You know what the terrible trap was? When you're a young youth pastor, you want to impress the kids. Like, man, I'm going to show you an activity you will never forget. Now, the problem was I'm dealing with suburbia kids. This is the 1980s. Most of their dads made six digits. That's a lot of money today. That was a lot of money back then. These were, let's just be honest with you, rich kids, spoiled, rotten, rich kids. That's who was in my youth group. Of course, it's the only youth group I ever knows, knew, so I didn't realize that at the time as I traveled the country. Now I realized, oh, that's why they were a bunch of spoiled, rotten, rich kids, okay? They weren't necessarily bad kids, but they, they were definitely hard to impress. So when I got up and said, hey, we're going to downstate Indiana, we are going to a cave, and I explained it to them, man, they were pumped. Wow, let's do this. Filled a couple of buses, one guy bus, one girl bus. We came down there, spent the overnight. The next morning, we're going to go in that cave. Now, you know, this is not one with big lights and signs, so you're, you're just walking through the woods, following this youth pastor, and there was a little grotto that came out of the earth, and it was perfect timing. We're going to pull up there. A bat flies out. Oh, it's great. The girls freaked out. The guys loved it. You know what I'm talking about. It was You could not have planned it any better. And it was one of those caves you kind of had to, you know, had to, you had to just kind of crawl through, and it was kind of get you a little claustrophobic, drop down into the little passageway. I mean, and sometimes you had to crawl on all four. It was just, it was the real deal. It was freaky, to be honest with you. And um, so we got down in that thing, man, and I'm telling you, we got 
and they're about a half mile, and one of our girls stuck a foot in the crack accidentally, sprained her ankle, it swelled, we couldn't get her out. Now, as a youth pastor, I'm thinking, how am I going to tell her parents that she's a half mile under the earth and we can't get her out? You know, how are we going to do that? Uh, fortunately, we had a physics teacher with us. Moral of the story, if you go into a cave, always bring a physics teacher. And uh, he knew mechanical advantage and all that kind of stuff, and he did fulcrum and all that kind of stuff. See, teenagers, physical science, physics, it's important. It might rescue you from a cave one day. And anyway, he put it in there. He, you know, moved that crack out. We pulled her out. And then so another guy had to get on all fours, and we had to put it on his back. It was unbelievable. In the meantime, I found out later, one of the girls got hypothermia. They had to call 911. She almost died. I am telling you, we came home from that activity. Kids said to their mom and dad, mom and dad, two kids almost died. We had a great time. Now you know why my dad told me to go back to college. But anyway, I said, son. But here's my point. When you're in a cave like that, if you turn out all the lights, guess what? You are in darkness like you have never been in. But the closer you get to the opening, guess what happens? You start to see light, and every te- step you take, this is going to shock you, but every step you take toward the light, you get more light, less darkness. And next step, you get more light, less darkness. And here's the point. You know how your understanding gets darkened? You start taking steps away from the light. And the light. And your thinking through process gets darkened. I'm not trying to be unkind. But if you think video games is where it's at, you've got a problem. You have a huge problem. And I'm just trying to get you to wake up and realize Jesus is who you need. You do not need your computer for fulfillment in life. I'm not trying to anyway be, be unkind, but I'm, I'm trying young people to help you understand that this is not a small deal. You're just going to live the rest of your life playing video games. When Jesus wants to use you in a way you never thought possible. See, your understanding gets darkened. Here's a few things. How about um, performance acceptance? Do you feel like you've got to perform before people accept you? That's wrong thinking. In other words, it's like this, friends. God does not love us because of what we do. I don't know about you. The reason we ought to obey his commandments is not so he'll love us. You know why we obey his commandments? Because he does love us. I put it this way, it's not performance acceptance, it's acceptance performance. Because I am accepted in Jesus and he loves me with an everlasting love, I want to do what he wants me to do. See, and performance acceptance is unbiblical. And if you're trying to do to be accepted by Jesus or anybody else, you got wrong thinking. Now, sometimes you get that from the family you grew up in because you had to perform to be accepted. That is not the way God operates. And performance acceptance is wrong thinking. It's a wrong thinking through process. Your ability to reason's gotten messed up. Unwise in decisions. It's like the person who goes out and buys a new car when you barely pay house payments. Why do they do that? Uh, it's like this. I hate to tell you, ladies, you get a. I'm not saying it's always wrong, but you get a hit of dopamine by shopping. Did you know that? You buy a new dress, woo, you feel good, right? Do women ever buy stuff they can't afford? Yeah, dress, whatever. They do that. They they shouldn't, but they do that. Why? Because they're trying to find fulfillment in that. Unfortunately for a guy, our tours are more expensive, okay? We may not. It's like when we go shopping, it's like anti-dopamine, okay? In other words, we feel miserable. But anyway, a lady finds fulfillment, we find misery. But but anyway, for a man, he goes out and buys a new car. Guess what? Hit a dopamine. I'm not saying it's wrong to buy a new car. I'm saying it's wrong to buy a new car when you don't have the money to buy a new car. (laughs) And there's a lot of people today who spend money just to get the hit, man. They want the hit of dopamine. They want to feel good, unwise in decisions. That's not thinking right. That's just not thinking right. Um, Tendency to tangents. You go to theological political tangents. Are you known for conspiracy theories? I'm just going to simply say, you say, well, preacher, there may be some conspiracy theories that have something to it. Well, I believe in conspiracy theories. I believe the devil's behind it all. (laughs) And anything out, you you talk about these conspiracy theories that have been around for hundreds of years. I'm thinking, man is not even that good enough to figure that one out. But I said, the devil might be. (laughs) But people who live and die, listen, never win anybody to Jesus Christ and live and die on political conspiracy theories, something's out of balance. So a tendency to tangents, you're not thinking right. People who are on tangents about things that don't really matter concern me (laughs) because they're not thinking right. Unfulfilled in life, already kind of touched on that. How about this one, disobedient in the home? You know, my dad used to teach me this. He said, Jim, actually, in the Bible, there's precious little that really addresses the home, precious little. 
I want to ask you a question. If a husband loves his wife and the wife uh, reverences her husband, will the marriage work? Every single time. It's kind of simple, isn't it? Now, here's what's the problem. One of the two messes it up. I wonder if uh, you've got a situation where the fathers bring their kids up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and the kids honor and obey uh, the parents. Will that situation work? And the answer is every single time. So it's like this. A husband that does not love his wife, like Christ loved the church, you can't do it, by the way, without the enablement of the Holy Spirit, but you can do all things through Christ which strengthens you. And the wife who's disrespectful to her husband, uh, you recognize when those two things, it doesn't work. Let me just put it this way. You're not thinking right. Anytime we don't think biblically, we're not thinking right. We're living in a world where people try to solve their problems without using the Bible, and it doesn't work. So uh, you try to bring your kids, if you don't bring your kids up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, don't be shocked when they don't follow the Lord. <laughs> Fathers, it's your responsibility to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And when you don't do that, well, that's the point. Thank God for His grace, but I'm, and God's grace is a wonderful thing. But my point simply is this. You and I cannot stiff-arm Bible truth and get away with it. It's like this. You can come to church, you can be well-respected here, but if you come to church on Sunday morning and watch anything you want on Monday night, it won't work. It won't work. It just will not work. See, when you are disobedient to clear Bible mandates about the home, it doesn't work. You're not thinking correctly. Your understanding's darkened. And if I know your understanding's darkened, I know somewhere you're not living in union with Jesus Christ. You are in need of revival. You are not knowing the spiritual reality of the presence of God. I don't know about you. I need Jesus to show up all the time or I'm in trouble. I need him. I need his spiritual reality, and so do you. I tell teenagers all the time, I need Jesus as much as you do, maybe more. See, that's the point. So understanding becomes darkened. We're not thinking correctly. We've taken steps away from the light. Or a person who runs from problems. There are so many multiple divorces and all these kind of things and multiple jobs. Years ago I knew a young man. He couldn't hold the job down to save his life. And you know, every time he got fired from the job, it was always the boss's fault. And finally, I realized something. There's one commonality in this guy's work schedule, and that is him. Pretty good chance he's the issue. You know what the problem is? Constantly running. We're living in a world where people do not face their problems. They run from them. Why? Because they're not thinking right. There's not a problem you and I face that Jesus isn't the answer. And I'm not overstating the case. Now, that brings us to the final point, which we don't have to spend a lot of time on. Look at verse 19 who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. That verse in the Greek language, all I can tell you is, is like laying it on. These are people who have abandoned themselves to ultimate selfishness. It's all about them. And of course, lasciviousness, the whole moral overtones. We talked about this some in Sunday school. But the idea is clearly this. When you keep going on the path, you can live without Jesus. You're not living with spending time with Jesus. You begin to not think correctly. Pretty soon you're going to step into moral impurity. They say 70% of all men who occupy the pews of evangelical churches, now that's a broader category than I'm comfortable with, but these are gospel preaching churches. 70% of all men that occupy the pews of evangelical churches are struggling with sexual addictions. 70%. And I'm going to tell you why. Because somewhere they stopped walking with Jesus. Their understanding got darkened. It didn't happen overnight. There's probably a young man in this room looking at filth on the Internet. And I'm telling you, sir, it did not happen overnight. Somewhere along the line, you stopped walking with Jesus. Your whole thinking process got totally messed up. And now you've abandoned yourself to filth. And even though you feel bad about looking at the filth, you say, I'll never do it again. Two days later, or maybe two hours later, you're back doing it. You've given yourselves over unto lasciviousness. You know what lasciviousness is? It is unbridled lust. It is passion and filth that has no boundaries and no restraints. Sounds like we're talking about 2020. 
And all I'm trying to help you, friends, is we didn't get in this mess overnight in the United States of America. What happened was, is in our independent Baptist churches, somewhere along the line, we stopped walking with Jesus, and we started getting our whole thinking process messed up, and pretty soon we're in a situation where we're abandoned the filth. And I will tell you, the problem of the U.S. is not in the White House, it's in the church house. It's never been the White House. Oh, yeah, we are in the White House. I'm talking about the one in D.C., not this one right here. Forgot where I was here. Yeah, okay, I forgot about that. Okay, now I'm throwing. Okay, yeah, White House, Tennessee. Okay, but that's not where the problem is. Of course, it might be in this White House. I don't know. I'm just teasing with it. But So, of course, some of the symptoms here of all kinds of things, things I won't go into right now. But one thing that happens when people get into moral impurity and sexual sin, the Bible says, don't miss this, they destroy their own soul. Whoso committeth adultery with the woman lacketh understanding, he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. 1 Peter 2, verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And all I'm simply saying, friends, is if you're at that stage, I want to show you how you got there. Well, you say, preacher, I see myself on this pattern. Maybe you see yourself just over here. You're, you're alienated from the life of God. You can't remember the last time you met with Jesus. Maybe you're there. Maybe you're at the point where, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not thinking right. <laughs> or maybe you're already here or you're in the moral impurity, sexual sin. It's got fingers in your life. You say, well, preacher, what's the answer? Well, notice what verse 20 says. But ye have not so learned Christ. Now, the word learned means, don't miss this, learn by experience. And what he's simply saying is, the way you get off the path is to once again link up in a very real, spiritual, experiential relationship with Jesus Christ, where you begin to know him. He becomes your friend. <laughs> There's a spiritual reality. It's not just intellectual. There's a spiritual fellowship you have with Jesus on a regular basis. That's the answer. Which really is getting back to not being alienated from the life of God anymore. <laughs> You've got to go back to where you got off. You start walking with Jesus through the Word of God, through spending time with Jesus in prayer, and you start having a real relationship with Jesus, you know what you'll do? You'll start thinking right. And it's the only way you can get out of the mess you're in. Now, there's more in the passage. I'm just giving you the gateway, the first step through, and we'll deal with some of this as the week goes on. But in the very first thing I want us to notice here this morning is to um, not walk. God says don't walk in the vanity of your mind.